I am so, so grateful to be here with you. I was thinking about it. I just received a, a new mission, actually. I didn't send you the update, uh, Robert, um, to be the vocations director for my community. And I was thinking about getting to come to Franciscan is like a calling. <laughs> it's literally like I've been talking to people that are like, I wasn't sure. Like, my mom had a sense, but I didn't know. Like, I couldn't like give way to it until I came and then I just knew. And other people were like, I was born for this. <laughs> you know? And other people are like, I still don't really know why I'm here, but I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> so I just feel like it really, and I, I, I look at, when I stepped foot on this campus as a sister for the first time, I was like, why didn't the Lord tell me about this when I was in high school? Like, I would have died to have gone here. Sorry. A little too quiet. Yep. <clears throat> <laughs> We're going to kick it up a notch. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's my joy to be here and be with you. Thank you, Robert, for the invitation. Thank you for... Um... <laughs> I took a vow of obedience. Anyway, I'm grateful to be speaking on receiving the promise, which is something I love to share, and interweaving uh, healing into it, the way that Jesus heals. But I thought I'd start with a story. Uh, I went to a symposium for religious sisters two years ago, and it was in St. Louis. And there were about 500 sisters at this uh, conference, and we were from about 60 different religious communities. So it was basically like a nun convention, um, <laughs> if you were to put it in layman's terms. And at the same hotel that we were staying at, there were two other conventions going on simultaneously. So uh, one was a cheerleader convention, <laughs> and the other one was a tattoo artist convention. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. So I'm going through the breakfast buffet, and it's like pom-poms and pigtails and skulls and dragons. <laughs> and Our Lady of Guadalupe on the tilma from like shoulder to fingertip and every rose that fell from it. And um, the topic of our conference was being a prophetic witness to the world. But I couldn't help but think, these people are witnessing to me. What am I seeing? I was looking at the cheerleaders. Come on. To be cheered on. This is so deep in us. We need to be encouraged. We need people to say, win or lose, I'm with you. <laughs> That's a witness to me. Then I looked at the tattoo artist. What were they saying to me? <laughs> A longing for permanence. <laughs> Commitment. <laughs> Memory. I saw names, faces, dates, uh, self-expression. <laughs> the symposium ended and we were taking a late night flight back to New York and it was overbooked. And whenever anyone needs volunteers, it's usually like, is anyone willing to volunteer? And it's like directly at sisters because they know that we should. But then they started offering us vouchers and meal tickets and the first flight out and another night at the hotel. And in a spirit of great poverty, <laughs> we totally cashed in. <laughs> and we stayed another night. But we went back to the hotel and it was kind of like a scene change. Um, Two new conventions were beginning. It was the Star Wars convention <laughs> and the body art exhibition. <laughs> now, this isn't some dream I had, okay? It's not like, oh, and then my third grade teacher was there and things got really weird. No. So then I was like, wow, what is being witnessed to me now? Star Wars. <laughs> the intergalactic battle for souls. <laughs> the force and the dark side. <laughs> the cry of the human heart to know your father. <laughs> All I know is that someone handed me a balloon lightsaber and I was so happy. <laughs> and as for the body artists, so two of them like tried to pass us in the hallway and their eyes were downcast and there was one, the artist, and she was short with like this hot pink pixie haircut. And the other one was like a six foot tall woman painted head to toe and wearing a robe. And they, they were avoiding us until the sister I was with couldn't help herself. And she goes, incredible. <laughs> and they both breathe this huge exhale. And they're like, oh, 
We thought you'd be mad at us. <laughs> you want to see the starry night on her back? And there it was. <laughs> and we both just thought and said out loud, I wish it were on a campus. <laughs> and the artist shook her head no. And she said, well, I don't. Beauty is fleeting and nothing lasts. So for a time, it moves, it's alive, and then it just washes down the drain and no one sees it again. Hmm. What is being witnessed to me? Yeah, beauty is fleeting, right? Life is fragile. It's true, but deep down, if I'm really honest, we thirst for an infinite beauty that does not pass away. I want a love that is forever and mine. This is the truth of our hearts. This is everything um, coming from our origin, our destiny, God. He is infinite and he has given us infinite desires. And only an infinite one can satiate my thirst for an infinite, stable, forever love. And he gave it to me and he gives himself to me. So tonight, as we focus on the gift of human sexuality, as we focus on uh, our desire for and need of healing, I want to turn to Jesus, who is the gift of God, and just start with a prayer. If you don't mind. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we love you. We open our hearts and we open our hands to your word, to your spirit, to your touch. Be with us this night. Heal us, Lord. Cover us with your precious blood that makes us new. <coughs> Blessed Mother Lady at Cana, look and see where we have needs we don't even know about. Please bring us the new wine. Amen. Holy Spirit, amen. So receiving the gifts of God, part of gift giving uh, is receiving. It's essential, actually. So gifts can be received, they can be rejected, they can be left unopened, they can be forgotten. And Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. So tonight I want to hit on three gifts. Um, and receiving them is our gift to give the Lord. First, receive the gift of life. Second, receive the gift of a new heart. Third, receive the gift of the kingdom. So first, receive the gift of life. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So the same God who set the bounds of the ocean, who placed the stars in their courses, who had a thought, and it became Niagara Falls, <laughs> or snowflakes, who crafted the orangutan, and the giraffe, and the peacock. That is one of my favorite creatures of all times. I mean, that bird has a 10-foot train of technicolor feathers behind it. And if it wants to get your attention, it's like, you know, well, bam! <laughs> I love that bird. I love that God did that. I mean, all of creation is bursting beauty and color and sounds and taste and smells and this intricate creativity. This same God made you with more care and more purpose than any of, those, any of those other creations. I mean, if you think about it, there was a time when you were not, you were not, you were non-existent, and then it's like, well, bam, you are. You become. Creation happens for you, and it happens for me. It's not a thing of Genesis. And I love to think about this because it's uh, my favorite thing in the world to think about and meditate on are fingerprints. Fingerprints are the number one personal identifier. They identify you as the only you who ever has been or ever will be, ever. And I think to myself, if God is going to take so much time to arrange and design the invisible circle patterns on the end of your finger to be totally unique to you, how much more the love in your heart? It's yours. It's distinct. No one else has it. It's yours to give. He so longs for this love, and you're the only one who can give it to him. And you're the only one who can receive his love 
into the space that is you. He wants to come to you. He says, I made you, you're good, you belong to me. In St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, he says this, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Uh, you know when your favorite song comes on, and uh, as soon as you hear like that first guitar strum, or like the piano interlude, you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's my song. <laughs> and you're like in a conversation, and you're like mid-sentence, and then it comes on, and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, that thought, it's my song. And you have this like inexplicable knowing without knowing how, that when God inspired it in the heart of the artist, he actually had you in mind. <laughs> You know, and you almost feel like you have to be like lying on your bed in the dark to like really drink it into your being. You know, or you're like in the car and it's like, oh gosh, window down, volume up, raise hand out. It's my song. I feel called to share my song with you tonight. It's a little awkward to do it without a guitar. I realize that. I thrive in awkwardness. <laughs> and I don't know how to play the guitar. So don't look at me for a second. Okay, ready? <clears throat> You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Thank you. That was really beautiful. It's really, really, it's your song too. Just kidding. It's our song. Um, we have a good father. We have a good father and he is seeking you. He knows that you're made for communion. He knows that you're made in his image and likeness. The Catechism says something really important, and I revisit it. It reminds us, no one is Father as God is Father. No one is Father as God is Father. We have a good Father, and He loves you. He is always present. He is never too busy or distracted or burdened by your desires, wants, needs, questions. He does not withhold himself. He always provides. And Jesus tells one of the sweetest, most beautiful, heart-rending stories to show us that we have a father who is affectionate, and he gives hugs and kisses to a son who's been with pigs. This is our father. And I think about the journey of sexual healing. It begins with a simple acknowledgement of these truths. God is good, and he chose you, and you're good, and your sexuality is a gift and your sexual desire is good, and it points you to an even greater good. We're made for infinite communion, for intimacy, and for a life-giving, lifelong, mutual exchange of love. So how do we receive this gift that is already ours, to be beloved sons and daughters of a good father who calls us to love and to be loved? Uh, we often live like orphans, and uh, there is actually something called an orphan spirit, and it can attach itself to us. So um, I begin living out of a belief that I am a burden. I'm alone. <coughs> I've been rejected. I'm outside. Um, I'm not someone chosen and beloved, but I'm someone who um, has to earn love, has to prove that I'm worthy and acceptable of love. I need, I need to establish my own identity because I don't receive mine from the Father. You're always striving to be better and it will never be enough. We need to seek deliverance and healing from this orphan spirit because Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. There was a priest living in San Francisco and he shared this story with us. Um, he received a panicked phone call saying there was a girl on top of the Golden Gate Bridge. Could he come to assist? Uh, now this priest, he was a very 
short man and uh, terrified of heights. He arrived on the scene and they pointed her out to him. Nothing would get her down. So although he was absolutely petrified, he stretched out his hands and began the climb up to the top. And the man is like shaking like a leaf and he's drenched in sweat. You've seen it. Like, it's like, it's like, it, it, yeah. <laughs> totally drenched in sweat. He's trying not to look down. It was a windy day. So the bridge is swaying. He's like, oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended me. I think he had perfect contrition too. Um, <laughs> She looks down from the perch and she sees a man struggling to reach her and she begins encouraging him. So she leans over and goes, hey, you're almost there. <laughs> you're gonna make it. She's 18 and um, going through a dark time. And as, as he begins to inch into plain view, uh, very evidently frightened out of his wits, she sees the Roman collar. So he gets up there to her perch and she pulls him over and father's just like rocking himself. <laughs> Not saying a word and she sits next to him and her heart is so moved. She's like, he doesn't even know me and he thinks I'm worth it. And father regains himself after a time and finally has the capacity for speech returned to him. And he looks over at her and looks into her eyes and he goes, how am I gonna get down? <laughs> and she said, I'll help you, okay? Now just put your leg, put your foot, you know what, I'm gonna go first. She goes down, okay, yeah, right here, step. Okay, hand here. No, a little bit more. Oh, slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Step by step by step. When they got to the ground, both of them safe and sound, everyone exclaimed, Father, what did you say to her? <laughs> <laughs> he can't breathe. She saved my life. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Jesus comes to the place where we are. He comes to the place where you are, and he says, you are not an orphan. You have a father, and he sent me. I give you my own mother as your own mother. You have a family and a home in the church. You are accepted. You are worthy of love, and you are capable of loving. Receive the gift of your life from him, your sexuality from him. I just want to take a minute to just let the gift of your life wash over you. Just close your eyes. Receive the gift of a new heart. When the angels fell, the father did not send his son to become an angel to save them. But when our first parents fell in sin, God could not bear to be separated from us. So he sent his son as a man to redeem us. The father said everything to us in his one word, Jesus. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So to the very places that you experience the deepest inadequacy, insecurity, confusion, the pain of abuses suffered, rejections, he comes to draw us out. The gift of God is for you, and he wants you to know how he sees you. Uh, when I was in college, uh, I knew a young man who was totally blind. And when I first noticed him, he'd be walking along very slowly on campus with his white stick, you know, feeling for the cracks and the sidewalk and the grass and the turns. And then some random kid would like sidle up next to him, and he would fold up his stick and put his arm in their arm, and they were off. I mean, like at a clip, and I was so stunned by his humility. And I did not go to Franciscan University, so a very secular, liberal, bizarro college. So I, I, all I could think of was, he has no idea what that kid looks like. 
and they're arm in arm and they're off. It was just so moving to me that he was so willing to be led and he understood that the offer of help was goodness and he trusted in that goodness. I finally had my chance to meet him and one day I, I sidled up next to him. I said, so what's your name? He goes, Milano. I go, Milano? He goes, yeah, like the cookie. <laughs> he was so dear and we became fast friends. And one day as we were walking to class together, I asked him, do you have dreams at night, Milano? He said, I do. And I said, what's it like to not have images? He said, it's voices, shadows, and light. <laughs> And in the 42nd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, the Lord says this, I will lead the blind on a journey. By paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn darkness into light before them and make crooked ways straight. So the vulnerability of sexual healing is something like this. It's raw. You know, we don't know the way. We're putting ourselves in someone else's hands and letting them guide us on a journey. Uh, with faith and hope that the darkness will turn to light as we take our steps before us. And we need to look to those who have already made the journey and who are making the journey valiantly. We want to receive courage from their struggle and their victory. And I just want to name a few resources for you. Audrey Assad's testimony at the Focus Conference. If you have not heard it, it is very <laughs> worthy of your time and an investment you, you won't regret. For her, after stumbling upon pornography accidentally as a teen, uh, she became addicted and this led to the habit of masturbation. She shares with such delicacy and transparency about her path to healing and freedom from the bondage uh, that listening to her words is literally like being doused in the Holy Spirit. Um, it's very moving. And Matt Frad, he shares uh, his witness in a very poignant way for men, and it's very profound. And then Dawn Eden wrote a book. She herself suffered the trauma of childhood sexual abuse, and she shares her story uh, in a book entitled, My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. Uh, every sister of life reads it. It is for any man or woman in this sexually pervasive culture. Uh, it, she weaves in her own story of healing from that trauma with the lives of the saints and traumas they suffered and abuses they suffered. It's, it's very powerful. You feel like you have a, a whole new take on uh, the beauty of redemptive suffering and the glory uh, of wounds healed. Then there's a documentary entitled The Desire of the Everlasting Hills. Uh, again, I think it's about an hour and it's very poignant testimonies of those who experience same-sex attraction and who find their ultimate fulfillment of their desires in Jesus. There's a, a, a wonderful scene. One of the men, when he finally receives the grace to go to confession, he hasn't been to confession, I think, since like his first. So he goes and he gets into the confessional box and he's like, Father, I have broken every commandment. And Father goes, you killed someone? And he goes, Father, I don't even know the commandments. <laughs> And he experienced um, the, the grace to be able to be freed um, and to live a, a chaste lifestyle. So really beautiful. These men and women witness how to seek help and how to begin choosing uh, healthy ways of handling stress, anxiety, how to begin responding differently and creativity to loneliness. Loneliness is a reality. We all experience it. It's part of the human experience but we need to begin recognizing it as an invitation to intimacy with Jesus and an impetus to serve others and to go out of myself. Giving generously. You know, there are so many saints who have fought this good fight and who have struggled, like Servant of God Dorothy Day, uh, who suffered an abortion after, after trying to save a doomed love affair. She describes her, her struggle to chastity. Blessed Charles de Foucault is a, is a modern day prodigal and he also was able to begin a new life. Um, St. Margaret of Cortona uh, woke up after the, the death of her, her lover. She also gave herself totally to Jesus. These saints, they reached for the Lord's hand when they were sinking into the deep and that's 
our response. So just as you're, as you're here on campus, as you're in this time of your life of preparing for your fo vocation, entering into a definitive commitment, now's the time to give God permission. I mean, consider if you desire it and if you, um, the benefit of counseling, then you're not alone and you have real tools to be able to untie some knots. Then there's accountability, you know, friends of the same sex being able to, you know, struggles in the area of sexuality do not need to be shared with everyone and shouldn't be, but they should be shared with, with uh, someone and some, someone trustworthy who can be with you in it. Then there's fasting. This builds up new habits. So like saying no to ourselves, bodily cravings, instant gratification. So I say no to this little dessert and I do not have it. And it's like, yeah, that no starts so small. But if I can say no to that, I'm gonna say no to much bigger things when they come. Or like withholding uh, myself and not giving into instant gratification. So I, I get something I can't wait to open and I wait 10 minutes. Little, little practices of mortification help us to build up this will that is like, which way to the beach, you know? Like very ginormous and strong and good to, able to fight. And then I was thinking, this is something, avoiding near occasions of sin. You know, we say it in the act of contrition, you know, I'm, I, we say that we're gonna avoid the near occasions of sin, but what is that? What is it in my life, you know? Near occasions of sin, this person, this place, this time of day or night, my response to this stress, this combination of things. Take the time to actually name them for yourself. What is my near occasion and how can I avoid it, you know, so that I can, I can really name it, see it coming, and be, be ready. The promises given by the Lord uh, to the prophet Ezekiel are given to you tonight. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. <coughs> I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you that you may live. I want you to just take a second right now and I want you to think to yourself and ask the Lord, what impurity does my heart long to be cleansed from? Am I ready to open up a place within for a new heart? So there are a few things that keep us from sweet repentance, the repentance that turns us back to God, and we need to call them by their proper name. So when I entered the convent, one of my classmates was from New Zealand, and she picked up on this trend that Americans call things by their brand name instead of what they actually are. So um, do you need a Kleenex? Could you put that in a Ziploc? You know, she, just, she just took note of that, and I didn't even realize we did this. So one day we were listening to a lecture in a stuffy auditorium. It was post lunch. And I have to say, I wasn't sure I was gonna make it without totally passing out. And my fellow Kiwi postulant leans over to me and she whispers, I could really use some scotch. <laughs> I'm like, say what? I mean, so could I. But I would never say that out loud. <laughs> and I turn slowly and look at her and she's holding her torn notebook in her hands indicating to me she could really use some scotch tape. <laughs> so I just calmly explained to her that that's one brand name that needs its object attached. <laughs> but I wanna name a few things that can keep us from receiving the gift of the new heart. The first one is fear. Fear has to do with punishment. It's a tactic of the enemy to make you think that you can't approach God because you'll be judged or condemned or receive the brunt of his anger. Punishment. Has anyone condemned you, woman? Neither do I condemn you. There is no sin that God will not forgive and priests have heard it all. When we go to confession, whatever we confess is literally blotted out by God and wiped away. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. I would assume you are, but if you're not, um, Jesus revealed his sacred heart to her. She was like the floor mopper of the convent. It's like those people, you just envy them. They're totally she was humble, hidden, not appreciated. It's incredibly beautiful. And Jesus revealed his heart and his love 
to her personally uh, and for the world. And he told her he wanted her to have a spiritual director. And his name was Father Claude de Colombier. So she told Father Claude about this happening. Uh, he was extremely skeptical. And he replied, uh-huh, yeah. So Jesus wants me to be your spiritual director. You know, if he appears to you again, I want you to ask him what the last mortal sin I confessed was, and then come back to me and we'll talk. She's like, okay. <laughs> she agreed and returned later to Father Claude, and she shared that the Lord had indeed appeared, and she had been able to ask his question. And Father was like, oh yeah. <laughs> what did he say? She said, I don't remember. He said, I don't remember. And Father Claude knew that that was Jesus and that that was true. And he became our spiritual director at all accounts. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about that. I don't remember. He blots it out. Then there's lies. <coughs> lies can keep us from receiving the new heart. St. Augustine, he believed them for years. When he felt torn and breaking free of his sexual addictions, he heard the temptation taunting him and basically saying, you can't live without us, over and over again from behind. But something was telling him, this isn't true life. He heard a voice say, take and read, and he opened the scriptures to a passage of St. Paul, which read, <coughs> not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy, Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. And he knew. He wanted to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, where would we be had Augustine not crossed that bridge and broken free? This man who became a bishop and a doctor of the church who defended marriage. Then there's shame. Shame keeps us from receiving the new heart. Dr. Brene Brown, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's a shame researcher, and she said this, if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three ingredients to exponentially grow. Silence, secrecy, and judgment. She said if you put the same amount of shame in a Petri dish and you douse it with empathy, it completely dissipates and can't survive. So shame needs secrecy and silence to grow. And the Lord in his goodness knows this, and he gives us confession as a life-saving remedy for death-dealing shame. St. Ignatius, in his 14 Rules of the Discernment of Spirits, uh, which are the, the rules that allow us to know if a movement in our heart is of God or of the evil spirit, uh, he says this in Rule 13, the evil one is like a seducer who says, don't tell anyone about this. And this instills fear, and it keeps us in shame when bringing it to the light would have set us free and can. One of the women in our hope and healing mission to those suffering after abortion, I'll call her Julia, uh, she had suffered two abortions in her young adult life and she shares publicly about the day she received a major grace to go to confession and she had to put Rule 13 into practice. So she made an appointment with her parish priest and as she drove, the battle was on. And I, I wanna use her words directly, she said this, I'm clutching the steering wheel when suddenly I started hearing a whisper. You don't have to do this. What about the second abortion? Are you gonna tell them about that one? You don't have to, you know. Why are you making this so hard on yourself? She says, I was fighting so hard through this, crying and praying, Hail Mary. I was feeling so much conflict and terror because I could not get over that second abortion. Where is this coming from? I lashed back, no, I want to heal. Hail Mary, full of grace. I got there in tears and Father walked me through the whole confession. And at the end, he put his hands down and as if picking up a lamb, put it over his shoulders and said, all of heaven rejoices when the lamb who was lost is found. Welcome home. For the first time in my life, I felt alive, and in love. I will not leave you orphans. 
just like in Julia's case, you know, in every sexual sin, there can be an attempt to fill this painful void. Something is missing in my life. Someone is missing in my life. So by giving in, though, a new void is created, and it's worse, worse than the first. And there can be a lack of hope. You know, I'll never find love, or I'll be rejected again. Uh, it begs the question, does this activity fulfill me in what I'm truly seeking, or is it crippling me? from being able to be a gift. What fills the void? This is what fills the void. Letting Jesus take us by the hand. One of my absolute favorite like lines of scripture, you know how you, I don't know, in, in my Bible, in my breviary, whenever it comes up, I like star it and, and put a little like, this one's for me. It's like my favorite song, just my favorite scripture. He says, uh, I was holding you by your right hand or he will hold you by your right hand. He'll take you by the hand. It's such a tender image. I love I love with, it makes me think of my little brother when we were very small when my mom would say, hold your sister's hand, hold sissy's hand. And he's like, mm, you know, but I was so gentle and tender with, <laughs> <laughs> with that little one. Uh, holding hands, it's so, so beautiful and tender an image. And it made me think about touch because we need to be touched by Jesus to be healed. You know, Jesus heals all of my senses. He heals my vision. Uh, my experience of touch, even, by his touch. We need touch. Touches that are safe, loving, uh, affirming of my goodness. And I was going through the scriptures, and it was like one after the other, the leper. It says, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Then there's the little girl. Everybody mocked Jesus for going to heal her. Taking her by the hand, he called her and said, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then there's the woman who was bent for 18 years, the daughter of Abraham. It says he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. They even recount, now they were even bringing infants to him that he might touch them. Malchus in the garden, he touched his ear, and it was healed. The blind men, Jesus, son of David, heal us. He touched their eyes, and they were healed. Peter's mother-in-law, it says he touched her hand, and the fever left her. One of my favorite, most absolute favorite healings of Jesus and, and the way that he did it and is the blind man who uh, he healed gradually. So he went into a town and they asked him to heal a blind man. And it says he took him by a hand and led him out of the town by himself. And then he put his hand on his eyes and he said, what do you see? And the man looked and he said, I see people walking like trees. And it's an incredible thing to say because it's almost like I see people who look like objects who aren't truly fully, I'm not seeing clearly. I don't see clearly right now. My, my, my vision's been skewed. And Jesus is like, okay, okay. <laughs> he puts his hands on him again and then he heals him fully and he can see. First thing he sees is the face of Jesus. And he tells him, don't go back into that town where you became blind and where you were used to living in darkness. Don't go back into that town. And I love it because this is how Jesus heals us. I mean, he, he heals us, it's a journey. We allow him to touch us and he wants us to see, and he wants us to see how he sees us. Jesus, who knows the betrayal of a kiss, uh, invites our touch. He wants us to touch him. I love when he says that to the apostles when they're shocked to see him. He's like, touch me and see, touch me, he wants it. The other part of healing uh, is, is forgiveness. This is the last part on receiving the new heart. Um, but unforgiveness is kind of like drinking poison and hoping someone else dies, but I drank it. Uh, forgiveness is the gift I need to give to others so that I can receive it myself. Jesus said, forgive and you will be forgiven. And this can be really hard. And that's, this is, the catechism affirms how hard it is. And it says, it's not in our power to forget an offense. The Holy Spirit, uh, works in the heart, though, that asks for this grace. Let's just pray for a moment. Who, Lord, do you want us to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? Come, Holy Spirit, bring that person to mind. Free us from any bitterness, <coughs> resentment. Help me forgive myself, Lord. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. 
The third gift to be received is the kingdom come, life in the spirit. I want to tell you a story about one of the women who came to live with us, Patty. So Patty came into our lives, and when her boyfriend found out she was pregnant, he gave her an ultimatum. And he said, okay, you pick me or the baby. And if you pick the baby, you can move out. Crushed and betrayed, she chose the child, and she moved into the convent with us. Although raised a Buddhist, Patty was often in the chapel uh, before we were for morning prayer. And she spent time in holy hour, and she would just look at Jesus. And during this time, she let him touch her. Touch her wounded heart, her bruised memory, her understanding of her identity, her sexuality. And reveal and speak truths to her about her dignity, his plan for life and love, her beauty. Her baby son came two months premature, which scared us all. And fearful for his health, Patty asked that he be baptized a Catholic at the hospital and given the name Patrick Joseph. He was put into the neonatal intensive care unit, one of those little incubators, and live he did. Patrick was a fighter. <laughs> he was so lethal. She could only hold him for 10 minutes a day because his heart raced so fast when he was in his mother's arms, he lost weight. I know. But it became like a real image of Holy Communion because Patty would prepare the whole day for her 10 minutes with Patrick, hold him for 10 solid minutes, and then put him back in and pray in Thanksgiving basically for the time she had with him and prepare herself the next day for her time with Patrick. It was powerful. Now, Patty realized if this is what I want for Patrick in his death, this is what I want for both of us in our life. So she joined up with the RCIA classes and to enter the church. And one of our other guests who moved in, she had grown up in Russia and had never been ex exposed to religion, loved Patty so much and was so struck by her joy that she started going to RCIA class just to hang out with Patty. <laughs> so she's like, sisters, I'm gonna go with Patty to RCIA. I'm like, bye. <laughs> Have so much fun. <laughs> RCIA. So Patty's student visa was up, and she decided rather than try and figure out what to do with a premature baby, as far as daycare is concerned, she decided to return to Thailand, where she was from. And she told the priest preparing her for her sacraments about this sudden change. And he said, Patty, you are indeed ready for baptism and First Holy Communion. And so I was with her the night before uh, the ceremony, and we went shopping. We were still looking for her baptismal garment. So I just want to paint the picture for you. Manhattan. Macy's. Thanksgiving Day weekend. 9 p.m. Stores closed in an hour. We ran in, and uh, Sister Rita and Patty ran one way, and I have a three-month-old in arms, and I'm running the other way, and it was like chariots of fire. Like, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> and at this point in my young religious life, I hadn't shopped for a while, so it was like very exciting. I was like, 66% off. <laughs> so I'm rifling through the dress rack, and I don't, I don't know what I look like. You know, here I am. A sister <laughs> in full habit, dress shopping at night with an infant. <laughs> so the gentleman who worked there approached cautiously, <laughs> like, sister, can I, can I help you with anything? Yeah. I said, yeah, you can pray that we find the most perfect baptismal garment for that young woman over there. Patty? Patty. No Patty to be seen. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, something like this, and he pulls it out, and he was like, oh. <laughs> had, like, pearls, like, all down the collar. It was, like, teacup length, fitter, like it was made for her. Details are important. He went and got shoes that weren't even on sale in the back that matched perfectly. He said, tell her to pick out any accessory she wants. And when we got to the cash register, let me just tell you, that didn't add up. Totally generous family 
discount of some kind. We don't know if he was an angel. We never saw him again. But we never went back to Macy's. <laughs> so, anyway. When we got home, Patty was like, sister, my heart is going like this. I feel like tomorrow is my wedding day. And it was. God wed himself to her soul in baptism. And then Jesus gave himself to her in Holy Communion. This is my body given up for you. I will create a new heart in you and a new spirit that you may live. Heaven starts here by living in the spirit we have received, the spirit that has been poured into our hearts, the spirit who prays in us, teaches us, consoles us, guides our decisions and discernments. The Lord does not ration his gift of the spirit and he won't force himself on us. He longs to be invited. Ask and you shall receive. Oh, we took a woman that we were serving and her three-year-old son, Sael, to mass for the first time. And when Sael saw everyone begin to receive Holy Communion, he tugged at his mom with like an urgency and he goes, mom, I want that. I need that. Please, mom, please. And she said, no, Salito, you can't have it. And he, it was like a precious moments cartoon, you know, with the big eyes and like the tears started to fill. And sister was like, it's okay, Sahel. She thought she might be able to reason with him. She was like, one day, Sahel, you'll be baptized and then you'll be able to receive Holy Communion. It was like, no consolation prize for this kid. <laughs> Uncontrollable sobbing and kicking. Forcible removal from the pew. <laughs> Complete humiliation. Later that week, one of the sisters uh, asked Sahel about his first trip to church. And he said this, it was God's house but I cried. <laughs> it, it, it is one of my favorite things in the world when little kids tell on themselves. It's just... <laughs> so sister played right into it because she could tell he really needed to get something off his chest. Oh no, Sayal. Why did you cry? Well, because they had God's love and they wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> oh, man. From the mouths of babes. You have found perfect praise, Lord. Jesus, who is love, knows that we have a hunger for love. He chooses to become food. He comes to us individually, intimately, and in a way that we can receive him. And he knocks at the door of your heart. Uh, I went to World Youth Day in Poland, uh, and it, the Sisters of Life helped uh, at a catechetical site. And one night, Audrey Assad and Matt Marr actually played, and Bishop Barron uh, led the Eucharistic procession amidst about 18,000 young people and a stadium and it was something out of the gospel. It was young people on their knees, reaching out, singing, crying. Um, it was very powerful. And the next day, I was talking to one of the young Polish security guards. His name was Radek, and he said, you know, sister, last night, in the midst of all those people, all I could think of was, I'm the only sad one in the room. I just kept thinking, why not me? Then he asked, uh, how do you know God loves you? And it flashed me back to a time in my life when I felt the exact same way. I was on my first retreat. It was in Eucharistic adoration. And I remember saying in my heart, looking around that room, wow, God, I don't know you as everyone else here seems to know you. And uh, I really wish I did. I want to know you. And for the first time, I sincerely opened my heart and I knew, without knowing how, that I was loved. So I said, Radic, Jesus gave you this desire to fulfill it. Uh, do you want to pray right now? And he did. 
But um, something got lost in translation because when I went to put my hand up on his shoulder, uh, he put his hand out and just met mine in the air. <laughs> And then closed his eyes. So now we're holding hands in the air, and I was like, okay. I thrive in awkwardness. So I squeezed. Release. Shoulder. And we prayed together, and it was very, very beautiful because of his openness, because of his desire, because it was so evident that God was desirous of him. And just saying, Radic, I know God loves you because I love you. And I am weak and limited. He called you into being. He's going to share his life with you. He wants to be with you forever. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So I thought uh, we could close tonight asking the Blessed Mother um, who received us as her own children. You know, the sign of the moon, I don't know if you know this, but Fulton Sheen says the moon is like an image of the Blessed Mother because it gives off none of its own light. It only reflects the light of the sun. And the moon tonight over this campus was huge in yellow. And it was like, I hear you, Blessed Mother. I see you, Lady at Cana. You always foresee our needs. Let's entrust ourselves to her and ask that we could echo her yes. Yes, Father, to the life you gave me. Yes, Jesus, to the new heart you won for me. Yes, Spirit, live your life in me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen.